Thank you, Joe. My pleasure to be here, as always. Um, certainly, I would like, first of all, to congratulate Garda and the LDS Society and the Marfant Foundation for all their wonderful work that they have done over the last 50 years by now, I suppose, um, 50 plus. So it really has been a journey with a lot of success, with a lot of things that haven't been accomplished, but just a wonderful experience to have been part of this. Um, I'm not going to say much about the Lois Dietz syndrome in spite of what Joe just announced. Is there we go. Uh, no, it's not. But anyway, but uh, uh, it, you, you know, we are just putting our data together and we don't have a lot of information on the eye findings in Lois Dietz. We all know that it started out as being normal and we see more and more patients with trouble and with difficulties. Um, so we have been putting, at this moment, we are analyzing the retina and the vascular distribution in the retina in patients with Lois Dietz syndrome, I don't know what the outcome is, but we should know in the very near future. Um, we are looking at the cornea in Lois Dietz, so, and at lens dislocation, and we all know of isolated patients with lens dislocation and Lois Dietz syndrome. That's as far as I go at this moment. So I really spend my time on the eye and the Marfan syndrome. So I have no financial interest, unfortunately, as they always say. Um, so there we go. Basically, we know that the Marfan syndrome is caused by mutations in fibrillin. And fibrillin is everywhere in the eye. But I would like to, and I don't know, it doesn't work that way, um, to actually first go over the eye, because the eye is always sort of an enigmatic uh, structure to uh, people. Um, you know, we all know we have a lens in there and a retina and an optic nerve and a cornea and kind of where does all of this fall with regard to each other. It's this, I'll just show you this. It's in this back. I get it, I know oh, it. it's this one. I know, yeah. Um, so as we go forward, so basically, the eye is still like a camera. You know, this, this comparison just hasn't changed. And you have a series of lenses that help you focus an image onto your retina. So you have an image at distance. I can see cars out there. How do I get them down here to my retina? You know, to the macular, to the area of sharpest vision. So there is a whole mechanism that focuses it in on this film that lines the inside of this whole globe, this structure. And that film is the retina. There are photoreceptors in there, and the photoreceptors through ganglion cells and nerve connections will get the information that these nerves receive through the optic nerve to the brain. Well, you don't see with your eyes, you see with your brain. The eye is the system that brings the information in, and you have to make sense of it in your brain. So what are those lenses? You know, basically you have the cornea here up front, and the cornea does the most significant power of focusing an image on the retina. It brings it down from infinity or, you know, the parking lot across the street, down to just four or five centimeters, to a small area like that. So it focuses it down, but it doesn't do the fine focus. And the fine focus happens with the lens, which we see here. And th so it's a, it's a, you know, a joint function, the major function of bringing the object into the eye and then the lens of fine tuning it. But there is only a certain range that this lens can use and how much it can actually focus it. And as we get older, we lose it. And as we get older, we need reading glasses because we just can't quite do it anymore. And we also can't really do it well <clears throat> if the eye is long. That is, if the distance from the front of the eye 
to the macular area is longer than normal. Normal is 24 to 25 millimeters. So two and a half centimeters, that's that much, that's very little. But in patients with a Marfan syndrome, this may be 35 millimeters. Rarely so high, but it can be very high. So I started off with just giving you a little bit an idea about the eye. But the structure, so, and let me continue with that theme. Basically, fibrillin is in every part of the eye. We know fibrillin is the substance, the protein, the gene that is mutated in patients with the Marfan syndrome. And fibrillin is here in these fine fibers that connect the lens through here, the ciliary structure to the globe and the ciliary muscle that goes all the way around. <clears throat> so in order to help with focusing and do that fine tuning, these zonules have to be intact. And they are not intact in patients with the Marfan syndrome. But they are, de they are deficient to various degrees. So in many patients, they may be just reduced by 5%, you know, or 10%. So it doesn't make any difference, and the lens won't be dislocated. And if the fibers are very severely deficient, the lens will not sustain the suspension. And it will dislocate. It's just a mechanical issue. Well, here we are, you know, kind of with the lens, with the cornea here, the lens behind the iris structure, which is here in blue, finely painted in, and the anterior chamber, and here the lens, and then you have the vitreous humor, which is a gel that is in there. It's like egg white. And, you know, the light goes through it. And it's, this is the only structure that is obviously normal in patients with the Marfan syndrome. And then you have the retina, which can detach, and we still don't know why, and it's fragile in the Marfan syndrome. You have choroid, you have blood vessel structures there, and you have an outer membrane, the sclera. And the sclera is like, the le it's called the leather membrane. And it's like leather. And if you have an eye that at, let's say, in, at death, it gets enucleated for whatever reason, and, so, and you put that eye, you can put it on the pathology table and it won't collapse. In the Marfan patients, that eye will collapse. So that structure, oops, that structure, the white of the eye, in patients with the Marfan syndrome, is more fragile, it collapses, it has just a different structure. And <clears throat> it's part of the reason, or a significant reason, why in patients who have normal, who have a normal intraocular pressure, may still have an elongated globe, because that structure, the sclera, that outside membrane, just stretches in patients with the Marfan syndrome. So we got the basics of what's going on. Let's continue. Well, the hallmark <coughs> of the Marfan syndrome in the eye and the eye findings is lens dislocation. <coughs> but lens dislocation only occurs in about 60, 65% of patients. So 35% of patients won't have it. Patients may not have it at age six or seven years when they are first seen. And, <clears throat> they, you know, they come back, they are sent because pediatricians suspect the Marfan syndrome. The children are sent for an evaluation <clears throat> and by an ophthalmologist, and the ophthalmologist says, I don't see lens dislocation. Well... That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's a progressive disease. And that lens dislocation can happen at any age. I, the oldest I've seen is age 72 years. So, and in patients who never had any evidence of it. So it's a lifetime problem. 
So that's a concept that really you ought to know. Uh, it's the fact that it wasn't found at age five, six, seven doesn't mean it's not going to happen, and it doesn't mean that the patient does not have the Marfan syndrome. And it just happens that they get seen once, they get thought their eyes are normal, and they get written off as being candidates for it. And that's another reason why people ought to have DNA analysis in families and know whether a patient is affected. Well, let's continue. You know, <clears throat> not all lenses look like this one. <clears throat> A sort of a ragged edge, as you see here, but you see it in patients, and you see these fine zonules that suspend that lens, and right there where there are more zonules, it will hold it, you know, hold it tighter, and the lens will round off, even though it appears flatter here, it will just sort of round off and retract where there are less zonules. So you find that irregular border. It's quite typical for the Marfan syndrome, but there are many Marfan patients who have a rounded off edge to the lens. Well, the distribution of fibrillin, <coughs> as I said, it's basically in all the parts of the eye. And you see it as you look here, you know, from the, from the uh, conjunctiva, the outer fine part, the sensitive part of the eye that I didn't mention, the cornea, the lens capsule, zonules, iris, ciliary body, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, basically, all the way to the back of the eye. Um, I mentioned here the iris. Uh, the iris is sort of a structure which is susceptible to develop to a developmental part of the disease. And in, in ACTA 2, as Dr. Milevich explains, you have very specific changes in the iris structure. And in patients with the Marfan syndrome, the iris may appear grossly normal, but it may be more translucent and certainly is thinner than in the normal population. And the pupil may appear, or may be, you know, much smaller than seen in the normal population. So you have a a pupil of two or three millimeters when three or four might be normal. So these are all features that help in making the diagnosis. As I said, fibrillin is everywhere, and we see it here drawn around the lens um, in a study we did many years ago, but just actually showing the distribution <clears throat> right around the edge of the lens, but also in front and behind, all features that keep the lens in place. And then, <coughs> as we look at real examples, if we can maybe reduce the light a little bit, it might be easier, uh, or if not, not. You know, you can just see the edge of the lens. And right here is a part uh, where you can just shine a light beam through the eye, you know, from the front. You can focus, if you want to, <coughs> through the lens, or around the lens. If you focus through the lens, you get that fine tuning. If you focus around the lens, you lose that fine tuning. Okay. Other pictures, lenses may be dislocated to the side. More typically, they are up and out but you see them dislocated to the side and you basically see all the positions. Here more dramatically dislocated to the side. You see the edge of the pupil right here and you see a few zonules right there and the lens is dislocated. So you see everything. The literature or the common knowledge is that the lenses go up and out. They do in the vast majority of patients initially, but it certainly and by no means the standard direction of dislocation. Sort of this patient had forever a, a lens dislocation in both eyes to the side, but in others it may go up for decades and then with gravity the lens may come down, fall back, fall into the vitreous and uh, uh, just uh, <coughs> and take that course. Here is a lens that's dislocated much higher up. And what we see here is actually that the lens is opaque. So the patient has developed a cataract. And cataracts in patients with the Marfan syndrome occur much earlier than in the general population. We all have relatives in their 70s, 80s get a cataract. 
The Marfan syndrome, it's more typically in the 50s, 60s, so 10 to 20 years earlier than in the normal population. But that cataract looks no different from the cataract you see in your elderly grandparent. Okay, let's move. Oh, let me make one more point right at this position. Okay, so you see here a lens that's dislocated upwards. Okay, well, you can now put your light beam through the lens or you can put it around the lens. Okay, that lens bisects the pupillary axis and you can use both areas to get that image into focus. You get that image into focus with a different pair of glasses, with a totally different refraction. That lens in a normal eye, this lens, a lens like that, will have a power of about 20, 23, 24, 25 diopters. What does that mean? It will bring an image into focus from, uh, from infinity to 4 centimeters. It gets related to 100. So this lens power is very high. And, you know, just through the zonules, it gives a lot of specific power. So if you take that lens out, normally, you have to replace that power. And you can replace the power in glasses, you can replace it in contact lenses, or you can replace it in an intraocular sutured lens. But none of those modalities are as nice as using your own lens, which may have maybe a decreased power of focusing, but still have power of focusing. But in a patient like this, and you know this is obviously a patient with a cataract, he has a, he's in his 50s, that patient uses this part of the eye to see and sees 20-20 in both eyes. You can just go around it. If you take it out, you still go around. You don't change anything. And people somehow just don't get that concept right. That if you take that, if you take this lens out, well, you know, go right ahead and use the space. There is a space big as a barn door. You can focus an object through this large space and get it into focus. You don't need to focus through the lens. And you finish up with exactly the same condition if you take that lens out that you had before and you have submitted the eye to surgery. Eyes that are fragile. And it just often doesn't make any optical sense. If your ophthalmologist can't explain to you what he wants to do in a detailed fashion to replace power of this lens when he takes it out, be it with glasses, contacts, or intraocular lens, just sort of think twice, three times. You have to have a way of correcting for the error that gets induced by taking that lens out. 24, 25 diopters. You may remember grandparents who used to wear glasses that looked like Coke bottles before people had intraocular lenses. And many Marfan patients, if, you, if the lens is further down and you take it out, or if you look, if you look here, <coughs> we'll need very strong glasses to get the image into focus. I hope that's kind of clear. One point that I wanted to make, let's go on. This patient, same thing, you know, you can, obviously the lens was left in, this patient sees 20, 20, you can just look around and refract around, no problem. Next. There we go. Um, the lens dislocation is progressive. I said that earlier, so, you know, if it's not present at age 6, 7, 8, it may be there at 15, it may be there at 20, and it may be there at 72. So the fact that it wasn't there early, don't, you know, take it that that <coughs> won't come with time. So I like to divide, and, you know, people divide the um, patients with the Marfan syndrome into different forms. And I like to divide it because basically the features are different. 
if you have the neonatal form, if the disease is present and obvious at birth, you find very different eye features. The lens in patients with the neonatal form, the lens is round. It is markedly reduced in size. And it doesn't look like a lentil. It's not flat, but it's round like a pea. You know, it looks not like an egg, but like a golf ball. It is just a different, it has a different form. And with that lens being small and round, you get a very different, um, you know, clinical appearance or one that you don't see, that ophthalmologists are not necessarily used to, and they have a tough time diagnosing this form in patients with neonatal Marfan syndrome. They have a tough time because they're not used to it. They're used to see the lens go up or down and not be round, round like a pea and right behind the pupillary axis. In these patients, the neonatal form have the worst eye refractive error. They're very high myopes. They may be minus 30. And a minus 30 lens is just the thickest lens about you can imagine. Then you have the classical form. <clears throat> well, people who get a lens dislocation at 5, 6, 8, 10 in the teens, and you see that the lens dislocation is then progressive. You get refractive errors. <clears throat> you get retinal detachments. And you get open angle glaucoma. We get back to that in just a little bit. And you have the delayed onset. There's no obvious lens dislocation for decades. 35% of patients, 40% of patients. You get early cataracts, cataracts in the 50s and 60s. And you get rare, rapid, total lens dislocation in some patients in their 60s and their 70s. And you may have a retinal detachment prior to getting lens dislocation. So what are the complications? You have high refractive errors. So, you know, most patients are born being a little bit farsighted. Most people are born being a little bit farsighted. Um, and then they get progressively myopic as the years go by. So that's kind of, you know, your average population. Marfan patients may, depending on the lens dislocation, can be very highly myopic or be mildly myopic or be myopic, let's say, at age four or five when they stand on top of the TV and the family gets annoyed and the child gets seen by uh, an ophthalmologist who prescribes glasses and doesn't see the lens dislocation. Well, you know, it's kind of the way it goes. The, uh, then people, when they are poorly corrected, early, when one eye is better corrected than the other, they may develop an exotropia. The one eye turns out. It is rare in the Marfan syndrome, but you see it. If you get your glasses right and both eyes are equally corrected, Marfan patients typically hold their eyes straight and do all right. Another feature that helps in making the diagnosis is this flattened corneal curvature. You know, the eye, the cornea on top has a power. And I said, you know, it has a power of, it's actually 45 diopters. Um, and in the Marfan syndrome, it may be 35, somewhere between 30 and 40. So it is flatter than the, Marf than the uh, general population. You then show uh, lens dislocation and increased axial length. Well... The problems, the real part that give problems to Marfan patients are the cataracts. At that point, you may have to do something or you can correct around. And it's the glaucoma and other retinal detachments. Glaucoma. We have a paper out on that about 25 years ago, 30 years ago. It gets cited everywhere and everybody asks for it. It's just amazing how popular that paper has become. So... 30% of patients with the Marfan syndrome with time will develop glaucoma, that is increased pressure in the eye. 10% of patients will get a retinal detachment. 10% is a lot because normal population is 1 in 10,000. Wow. You know, that's a tremendous increase. So, 
and the retinal attachment will be spontaneous. So there is a fragility there that leads to it, which after lens dislocation is even further uh, prominent. We see here a patient who doesn't have the pretty picture we saw earlier, or sort of, sorry, of uh, the uh, macular area, but there is sort of an outpouching of the retina in the back. You know, instead of having a flat curvature to the back of the eye where the macula is, there will be an outpouching. And that is called a posterior staphyloma. It is seen in some patients with the Marfan syndrome, but is really not all that prominent. That I didn't, oops, okay. Um, so basically, the features of the Marfan syndrome in the eye go from the front to the back, flat cornea, dislocated, stricated lens, um, glaucoma, retinal detachments, difficulties with getting the refraction right. Um, and, you know, you just have to find your ophthalmologist who takes care of you, who diagnoses the uh, um, ret early retinal detachment and helps you manage it, who makes the right indication and the right decision with your help of taking the lens out and replacing it. Um, and that's a tough decision that I really can't give you general rules on. Um, I wish there were a one answer that would fit everybody and that we could prevent the retinal the lens dislocation. We cannot. Um, the intraocular lenses that you use in the normal elderly population when you put uh, when you take a cataract out are not appropriate for Marfan patients because they rely in their suspension inside the eye on the zonules. And the zonules in the Marfan syndrome, as we heard, are defective. So there are issues that need to be individually handled and that can be handled with getting the refraction right. Patients, I think, need a once-a-year examination in order to be sure <coughs> that they don't have... Um, you know, uh, that they don't have ocular complications. And they come progressively and with time. And it's better you know an ophthalmologist, one. And it's better you know an ophthalmologist who, who knows you, you know, and who takes care of you. If your eyes are normal, you know, and have been normal on previous examination, maybe you can be seen every two years. Every three is maybe a little too much. But so you can just space it and get an individualized management of your eyes in the Marfan syndrome. There are enough problems cardiologically um, so that to keep, do the best to keep the eyes as healthy as can be and just really uh, try to find an ophthalmologist in your communities who would take care of all the Marfan patients. They'll do a better job because they understand and they get experience on how to handle the issues. And, um, you know, just go for it in every community from Toronto to Ottawa to whatever, to the U.S., every big city ought to have one person who takes care of patients. Thank you. Thank you. now because we have a workshop later on so we don't have to okay. yeah I'll be fast That's okay. um, you spoke about the fact that ectopia lentis can happen at any age uh, but can it correct itself no well you, you know let me let me change this um, it, you know to make a diagnosis of lens dislocation um, you, have, you have to measure the amount of dilation mm -hmm. of the pupil. Mm -hmm. If the pupil isn't very dilated, you may not see the edge. And the next examination, the pupil is well dilated, and you see the edge of the lens. That doesn't mean it has, or the second time or the third time you don't see it. That doesn't mean it has corrected itself. It's just that the examination has found the patient under a different condition. Because our so one of our son has uh, Louis Dietz and has ectopia lentis. Yeah. So, you know, ectopia lentis is present. The first patient, Louis Dietz, when Bart Louis was at Hopkins and and Hal sent to me, uh, had a tuft of sort of new vessels on the nerve head. 
But short of that, the eye examination was normal and didn't have lens dislocation. But, uh, you know, you see a spectrum of disease in the Loisteeds and they're all a little rarer. And I don't think we really have a good, good statistical data on that condition. Thank you. Irene, can you just tell us briefly, um, in someone who doesn't have any clinical problems with their eye, someone with Marfan or Loisteeds, how often should they be assessed by an ophthalmologist? Uh, I basically think... Yeah, you know, once the initial phase is passed and the situation has been stabilized and you know both eyes see equally well and you have treated the amblyopia, got the bis glass, the eyes are straight. Still, if they're in the growing, growing age every year. If, let's say, they're in their 20s and they're doing fine, every two years is probably good enough. But glaucoma will come or retinal detachment may sneak up, or patients, you know, have medical problems, and, and, you know, and the eye visits get delayed. Just put it on your agenda and do it. You know, it's, it, as patients say, it feels good to know I'm doing all right. You know, but don't, don't just spend the time and saying, you know, well, next year. It's just not going to work. Every two years as a minimum, ideally every year, and as long as things are critical more frequently according to the symptoms. And just to clarify, an, an optometrist is not adequate. And what about a general ophthalmologist, or should this be an ophthalmologist with a particular interest in uh, marfan Loisteeds? Not every small <coughs> community may not have that, but can you just tell us a bit about uh, who, sure. who we should be seeing? I, th I think this is obviously a difficult question. But if you have an optometrist, they simply aren't equipped to diagnose early glaucoma, to find a hole in the peripheral retina that needs to be treated. You know, you may just be underdiagnosed in something that can be treated easily at a stage when you first go, if you go to an ophthalmologist. I have no financial interest whether you go to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, but take the trip to go to somebody who has some expertise, at least an ophthalmologist. And then go from there really to somebody in the community who is really interested in connective tissue diseases, for example, or an eye geneticist, somebody who spends uh, time on learning about those conditions. You'll do better in the long run. But obviously, you know, if you live somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, you don't have transportation and can't get anywhere, just a person who sees you is better than nobody, but maybe not. You know, you may just get an idea you're doing fine and, and ignore the symptoms and not see anybody. Yes? Just a quick question. Is there a, a high incidence of detached retina in SMAD3 patients? In, I didn't understand you. I'm sorry. Uh, is there a high incidence, rate of incidence in detached retinas and SMAD3 Patients. You know, I don't think so, but I don't, I'm not sure I know that fully. But because the patients I have seen didn't have a retinal detachment, but my number is small. Mm -hmm. Diana, do you know if uh, SMAD3 has retinal detachment? You haven't seen it. No. Michelle, yeah. in Calgary, you have a lot of SMAD3 patients. You have... Okay. okay, so SMAT3, but you know, I don't, have a good, I don't have good enough data to say that. So I have seen somewhere between five, maybe five, six patients with SMAT3 mutations, they all had a normal retina and normal lenses. But it's small vessel disease, it's just a different smooth muscle disease, different disease. <laughs> Yeah, I think it needs to be defined by mutation. And, you know, there is an advantage of, um, you know, defining Lois deed specifically and, and getting the mutation straight, the gene straight and the mutation straight to get the correlation right. There are some 20 diseases, um, genes that lead to dissection of the aorta, and they all have a different underlying mechanism and a different disease and different prognosis. So it really needs to be fine-tuned to make sense of this. Mm 